Discovery Church. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Man, I'm stoked that you're here for a brand new series. Um, get ready. I hope you got your seatbelts fashioned, yeah? It's going to be an awesome journey together. Uh, it is the first Sunday of, De- of, of November, though, and, uh, and some of you guys know in the Hannish home, it's Christmas time, right? How many of you is it Christmas season already? Where are you at? There's the, and then all the haters, all the haters looking at me crazy, right? So in, in the Hannah's home, the, the, the day after October 31st, so November 1st, is Hannah's Christmas Transformation Day. And we decorate for, and for some of you are like, but what about Thanksgiving? I hear it every year. Well, Thanksgiving, don't overlook. Look, I'm, I love Thanksgiving. We have Thanksgiving traditions. I love, and I'm very thankful that Thanksgiving is in the Christmas season. Very thankful about it. So this was our tree. Our tree on Monday at 11.04 a.m. We're ready for Christmas in the Hannah's home. Oh, whatever. I love it, you guys. It's, it's a great season. For us, it's, it's an, I think, though, for a lot of people, it's a stressful season. Even for us, like, it's great. I enjoy it. We have a lot of family memories. Um, but it's also a season that does come with some tension. It comes to some anxiety, it comes to some pressures, some time commitments, some, some constraints, some we got to do this and do this, and, and by that and by that. And, and so there's a lot of pulling that happens in this season. Simply put, there's a lot of turbulence that happens in this season that a lot of people experience. And you're probably in here today, and you may be experiencing a little bit of turbulence. Here's what our, our working definition of turbulence for this series. Check it out. There we go. It's the rough patch you have to go through to get where you need to be. It's the rough patch you have to go through to get where you need to be. If you've ever flown on a plane here, you've, you've experienced most likely some, some turbulence, okay? And depending on the size of the plane, if it's a small plane, it's a rough, it's a rough turbulence ride, okay? I remember the first time I flew on a plane and experienced some turbulence. I don't know if you recall your first encounter with turbulence, but outwardly, I was trying to act all hoard and stuff. Like, I'm cool, I'm fine. But inwardly, I'm like, oh my God, this does not feel good. Something is definitely wrong because it doesn't feel, it doesn't. Like your stomach is like, because your altitude drops up and down and up and down. And so it's, it's a little unsettling. It really, it really is. I remember the one, now that I fly, when I fly now, I'm cool, I'm fine with it. I'm like a pro now. Now I can spot the noobs, you know what I mean? The guys with knuckles are white, they're holding their, their armchairs and stuff. This last time I was flying, this, this elderly lady was sitting by this young man who's, it was very noticeably his first time flying. He's just gripping the thing, man, and, and he's breathing heavy, and she just, and I'm on this side of the aisle, and so I'm here in the car. She just leans over and she says, it's your first time, isn't it, son? And he's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And she said something like this. She said, she said um, don't worry, you'll get used to it. And, and I think that, like, the, if, you're, if you've ever flown, then you've experienced the turbulence, but you've also heard the captain come on. And if you've got a good captain, he'll, he'll let you know. Like, he'll put the light on, right? The seatbelt will come on, the seatbelt sign. And, and he'll let you know before the turbulence even happens. Because they got, like, gears and gauges, and they're able to, to see the currents, and, and they're measuring stuff. So they know, like, it's coming ahead. And so you got a good captain that's kind of watching his gauges, and he's going he's gonna to say, hey, the fastener seatbelt line is on. We're going to be encountering some turbulence here. And he'll even sometimes let you know, it'll be for the next five, six minutes, and then we're going to be out of this thing. No, no need to worry. It's not going to delay us at any time. And so, so if you got a good captain, he'll tell you even when it's going to, when it's going to happen. Here's what doesn't happen, because it would be ridiculous. It would be ridiculous if the captain tried to avoid every turbulent current. If he tried to fly around all of the turbulent, it would be a waste of energy, a waste of fuel, a waste of time. You would never get really to where you want to be if you have to fly around all the turbulence, which is what a lot of people try to do through life, is you try to avoid the turbulence. You try to just go around it, and you're wasting so much time and energy and resources because you don't know how to respond to the turbulence. And so in this series, I got, I got four principles for you to, to either to, to respond to the turbulence so you're not white-knuckling your armchair and it's not unbearable for you, or to maybe even 
like overcome that thing, to spot when it's even coming so you can react to it accordingly. Amen? Okay, here's our theme verse, Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 through 7. says this, rejoice in the Lord. When? It's always. What do you mean? Even when there's turbulence? He just put on the light sign. I'm scared. It's coming. I don't like the feeling. This doesn't feel good. This is scary. Can I rejoice? Really? Always? Can I do that? Yeah, you can rejoice in the Lord. Always. I say it again. Rejoice. And not only that, he says, let your gentleness be made evident. Like you don't have to be a jerk just because you're going through turbulence. You don't have to be so short-fused and short-tempered. You don't have to be, you know, just kind of frustrated. Just because you're going through a turbulent time doesn't mean everyone needs to be turbulent with you. Your emotions don't need to be turbulent. Your, your words don't need to be fueled by turbulence. So he says, not only can you rejoice even through whatever storm and turbulence and pressures and restraints and the stuff you're experiencing, but you can actually have even gentleness through a turbulent season. And then he tells us, because the Lord is near. And for some of you, 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 don't, you don't know this and you need to know. Listen, just because you're going through some turbulence right now doesn't mean he's far. He's actually close. The Lord is near. He is so close. In the middle of your storm, in the middle of your anxieties and your pressures and the things that you're enduring, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God which transcends, and I love that word, transcends. You ought to like circle that if you're taking notes or if you got your Bible. That's a great word. I'm going to show it to you in a moment. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding. That's what's going to guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So I looked up that word transcend in, in the original language that your New Testament was written in, Philippians here, was written in Greek. And the Greek word is hyper echo. Isn't that a cool word? That's just a cool word. Hyper echo. Here's what it means. To rise above. To rise. Look, some of you are trying to, listen, some of you are trying to power through your turbulence. You're trying, you feel the turbulence. Like, like you, you sense it. Your body is giving you signals. The Holy Spirit is giving you signals. You got your emotions and your, your, your health and your, your mind. Like you got warning signs flying. Like, hey, turbulence, turbulence. And you know it's coming. And what you do is you try to just buckle down and power through then. And, and let, me just, let me just work a little bit harder. And, and the Bible says that, there is a peace that actually will rise above the anxiety and turbulence. Like you don't have to power through it. You keep powering through the turbulence and you're going to have engine failure. Are you hearing me, guys? What God wants to do is give you a peace that rises above. Check this out. It is superior in rank, authority, and power. That there is a peace that God has available to you that has a superior rank, authority, and power to all of your anxiety, all of your pressure, all of your commitments, all of everything pulling you. You have, you have a peace that allows you to rise above the turbulence. It has more authority. It has rank. It has power. Today, I'd like to talk to you about something I believe that affects, I would say, 90% of us in the room today. I would go as far to say that the, the principle I'm going to share with you, and I got four of them in this series, four turbulence principles to help endure and overcome and rise above the turbulence. The one I'm going to give you today, though, I think is an, it's an epidemic in our society that we're dealing with this. And a lot of us are experiencing turbulence because of what I'm going to talk about today. Like it's sucking the life out of us. Today, we're going to talk about, listen, our hectic pace. Our pace of life, our lifestyles, our schedules, how we spend our time, how crazy life is for a lot of us is the reason. It's the culprit that we're experiencing the turbulence that we're experiencing because the pace of our life. Man, you know that you're too busy when you can't even finish reading the book about stress that you started reading. You're too busy. Some of you know you're too busy when you, when you tell your kids, it's time for lunch, it's time for dinner, and they run to the car. You're too busy. Come on, somebody, that go over your head, amen? You're too busy. You're way too busy. There's an old saying, the wise man is never busy, and the busy man is never wise. So we're going to deal with this today. This is how bad it's gotten. I did some research on the average American, how they're going to spend their time. Check this out. The average American is going to eat out 14,411 times. 
including 1,811 trips to McDonald's. Live long and prosper, you guys. There you go. They're going to spend 13 years and four months watching TV. <sighs> spend five years waiting in lines. Ouch, right? Like, oh, man. Spend an entire year looking for misplaced items. <laughs> Where are my keys? Attend 35 weddings. Drive 627,000 miles. God bless you. Do you feel better today now that you came to church, right? Okay. This is really just a snapshot of what our, what our lives look like. But here's the deal. None of us, like uh, no one on their deathbed wishes that they would do any of these things. Like if I could just go to one more wedding, I would just, oh man, on my deathbed, like, oh, if I could have just attended one more wedding. No, no one. Here's, but we spend our time on things that are not relevant or important or valuable to us, even though we don't want to, and we just continue doing those things. And for some of us, listen to me, this message today is so important. Like this is like a wake-up call for something. Like the handwriting is on the wall. You sense it in your heart, your soul, your mind. Things are breaking down inside of you and outside of you because this is the culprit. It's the pace of your life. And for some of you, the signal's on. Like that's in your, it's like, the, hey, the captain is going, there's turbulence ahead. You better buckle up. You better change something. The handwriting is on the wall for some of you. The hand, you ever hear that phrase, the handwriting is on the wall, is actually, it comes from the Bible. Do you know that? I got, I got the story in your notes. I'm going to back up a little bit and give you the context where that, that, that phrase even comes from. The handwriting's on the wall. Check it out. In Daniel chapter 5, starting at verse 1, it says this. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. So he's just living carefree, right? While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to do something, listen, that would ultimately mock God. It would ultimately mock God. And listen to me, God will not be mocked. He won't be. Look what it says. He said, bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. So they were holy things that were in the temple. They used to be in the temple. So that the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines might drink from those holy things. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines just mocked God and drank from them. And as they drank the wine, they praised the gods, look at this, of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. These are all types of my own efforts. I mean, I'm going to work as hard as do as much as I can because I'm in charge. Okay, look at this next verse. It says, suddenly. Somebody say suddenly. If you go too far and you don't heed the warning signal, signals, you're going to have a suddenly moment. You're going to have a, a sudden, and God will, listen to me, God will allow some things to happen in your life and for you to experience some things so he can wake you up. And for some of you, if you don't heed those warning signs, sometimes it'll, God will let it, God will let you have a breakdown. He will. He'll let you have, he'll let you go all the way to that divorce even. If you don't heed, the, but you know, some of you know, like it's there, you you just need to listen to the signs. This could be the, it's the pace. It's your chaotic schedule. It's your time. Because suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared. And I didn't, I don't know if it was like an Adam's family situation. Like, like came out of a box or something. The Bible's funny, man. It's just crazy. A hand appears and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal place. The king watched as the hand wrote it. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak. And look, at his knees had fellowship. They were knocking against each other. And then the king summoned, or he called for a worldly response. He, he, he goes and he tries to ask worldly people for, because here, here he is, he's mocking God. He's not going to go to God for answers. So he's going, let me try to go to the world to get some worldly people. So he summoned the enchanters and astrologers and diviners. And then he said these, uh, to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck. And he will, it sounds like some old 80s rapper. I don't know. And he will be made the third, <laughs> the third highest ruler in the kingdom. And so nobody could do it. Nobody could. And I'll just tell you, you can go ahead and look to the world for your soul problems and your spirit problems, but the world has no answers for you. 
eventually for the problems of your soul and your spirit, you're going to have to come to God. You will have to come to God eventually for the soul and the spirit problems that we have. So no one, no one had the answers. No one had the solutions. So they go, who in Babylon? Well, there's this guy, Daniel. He knows God. He might be able to help us out. He's connected to God. So it says in verse 25, Daniel comes along and he says, yeah, this is the inscription that's written. And it's three words. One of them is repeated. Many, many, tekel parsed. And Daniel goes, well, I know what that means. And he interprets it. Here's what it means. Many means God has numbered, king, the days of your reign and brought it to an end. So he says, look, you think you're living it up just mocking God, and you got all this time. You got less time than you think, king. Your days are numbered. It's actually coming closer than you think. Tekel, he says, you have been weighed on the scale. So you've been been put on the balance and have been found wanting. Here's what he's saying. King, your life is out of balance. God has weighed your life, and you are out of order. You are out of balance. Perez, which is the plural of parson, he says, your kingdom is going to be divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And listen, there there will always be a price to pay when you get out of balance. In fact, you may want to write this down. (laughs) Here's the signal. Our lives can easily get out of balance, but it will always cost us something. It will always, it will always, if you do not heed the signal, the light got turned on, the Holy Spirit is checking you. There's things, even your body is telling you something is off. And not, this doesn't, we're, we're, like your mind, your body, other people, like if you don't heed the signals, it will cost you something. And it's so easy for our life to quickly get out of balance and out of order. And when it happens, bad things happen. Simply put, you will experience turbulence if you are out of order, out of balance. And this is a dilemma that's going on in our culture and our society. And I just pray that the word of God speaks to you today in a powerful way. I'm going to give you five things that you can look for. And I bet you're going to recognize at least three of them in your own life. Like when your lives get out of order, when you're, when you're out of balance, you're going to experience these five things. Okay. All right. Check it out. Here's, here, take some notes from me today. Number one, here's the first thing you'll experience if you're in a hurry. And that is the risk of simple cho- choices increases. The risk of simple choices increases. Like when I'm tired, my resistance level lowers. Like I can discern right from wrong, but when I'm depleted, I'm unstable. I'm, I'm, uh, so when I'm tired, that's when the enemy sets the trap. The enemy doesn't set the trap when you're full of God's word. Like some of you, like, like when you leave out of this, this church, you're like, you're full of God's word, you're full of hope, you're full of life. You're like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do different. I can, I can take the world by the tail and stuff. The devil's not going to set a trap for you right outside these doors. He's going to wait till you are emotionally drained. That's when he's going to set the trap. When you're depleted, completely exhausted. Jesus warns us in Luke chapter 21. Look what he says. Be careful or your hearts, that key word there, your hearts will get messed up. So it's, it's going to get weighed down. So it's not just the amount of activity. Listen, it's what the activity is doing to your heart. It's how it's, it's weighing it down. Your hearts will get weighed down with dissipation. You know what dissipation is? It's, it's a little by little evaporation. It's a little by little leaking. It's just my heart, because of the pressures, because I'm not responding to the turbulence, to the signs, to the warnings. Little by little, I'm just... I'm just getting my life sucked out of me. Dissipation, drunkenness, and anxieties of life, he says. Some of you are more tired today than you were on Friday. Like you've had a day off and you're still more tired today. Like you're dreading tomorrow because you feel like you're just as tired as when you got off work. Something is wrong with our hearts. Something is wrong with the way we're using our time. And he says, and that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. You're stuck. And that's where some of us get. And the culprit, I'm telling you, the culprit is the pace of our life. It's the schedule and the hurry. Okay, here's the second thing that we can see when, you're, when you get out of balance and out of order. Number two, my emotions are inconsistent. My emotions are inconsistent. So the chances for me to get angry are a lot higher when, when I'm in a hurry rather than when I'm not. Think about the last time you were late for something and you were trying to get there. Right? You're in the car and you're like cutting people off and yelling at people and, and like getting mad at them and you're giving them the wrong kind of wave. You know what I mean? You're just, and you're like, 
you're so frustrated and you're like, that's my parking spot. I have my blinker on. And you're like ready to fight somebody in the parking lot. And like, here's, listen, listen, just, <laughs> it's, and some of you get to this place where you're like, I don't know why I do that, man. I don't know why I'm so angry. I'm not an angry person. I'm not a frustrated person. That's not me. You're right. Listen to me. Some of you, you're right. You're right. That's not you. It's your pace. That's not you. It's your chaotic lifestyle. That's sucking the life out of you and turning you into something that you're not. You know, here's how you can tell. Try this. Try leaving 30 minutes early next time. And just see, just see what kind of different person you are. Like you're not yelling at your kids for them to get in the car. You're not yelling at your kids 30 minutes early. You're good. You'll be like driving and be like, no, you first. No, 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 you're good. I'm good. Go ahead. You're at the stop, not like trying to like, you know what I mean? It's the, it's the schedule of your life. Here's what Job chapter 9, verse 25 says. My days go by faster than a runner. They fly away, and here's the result, without me seeing any joy. So let me say it this way. It, anytime you're in a fast pace, you have less joy. Anytime you're in a hurry, you're in a fast pace, you will have less joy in life. The slower the pace, the more the joy. All right, this is, I'm telling you, this is just a culprit when you're in a hurry, when you're out of balance. Here's the third one. You're actually less productive when you're hurrying. You're actually less productive. We, we think that by doing more, you accomplish more, and that's actually not true. I know it's counterintuitive for, for a lot of us. You only accomplish more when what you're doing is done with a sharp ax. Okay, because some of you, you're doing more, but your axe is dull, and you're out there chopping at a tree with a dull axe, and then someone took the time to sharpen their axe and go out there and just take a few swings at that thing, and it's, so we're not, we're not slowing down to sharpen the axe head, we're just going and going and going. I'm telling you, you can do more with less and less with more. Come on, you can do more with less and less with more, I'm less productive. Proverbs chapter 21, the Bible is filled with this stuff. Man, I could have done an entire series on this topic alone. There is so much material I could have used on this topic. Proverbs 21 verse 5. Careful planning puts you ahead in the long run. But look at this, hurry and scurry, that actually puts me further behind. Well, I thought I was, I thought I was working hard. I thought I was doing, no, you're actually working against yourself. Proverbs 19 verse 2. A person in a hurry makes mistakes. Every one of us has examples of that, don't you? <laughs> so, so I'm less productive. Check out this fourth one. Hopefully the Holy Spirit is revealing some things to you. Here's the fourth one. When I'm in a hurry, I end up empty inside. I end up empty. I get to the end of the day having worked so hard, and I think, for what? For what? I, what, I, what I, work? I, I thought this was going to satisfy me. I thought this was going to bring me accomplishment, this feeling of fulfillment, this feeling of gratification, this feeling of, 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 of happiness. And like the more I worked, the more I did, the more I just thought it would scratch the itch, and I still itch. It still itches. I still feel like there's more to do at the end of the, the day. Psalm 39 deals with this. Psalm 39, verse 6. We are merely moving shadows, and all of our busy rushing ends for nothing. Man, I just feel empty because I'm just running so hard all the time. Here's the last symptom. When I'm tired and exhausted, and it's probably the most important, I just can't hear God. I can't hear God from that place of hurry and my chaotic schedule. And I want to say something to you that some of you probably don't realize, and that is God is speaking. Let me say it like this. God is speaking to you. Because some of you, have, you've, at different times of your life, you've maybe asked somebody, a pastor, a leader, a person, like, like, I, like man, how do I hear God? I can't hear God. Man, I, I wish I could just hear God. He's speaking. Like, he's, it's not that God is not speaking. He is speaking. It's, it's just that the, it's all the thousands of competing voices and distraction that is drowning out the voice of God in your life that you can't hear him. Now, if we don't learn this principle, this beautiful Psalm 46 principle, you'll never... You'll never hear him. Look what it says in Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. And I'm telling you, this is a word for some of us today that our lives are so frantic. They're so chaotic. They're like moving in different directions. We're going so fast. And it's not that God is not speaking. It's just that we don't be still long enough or quiet long enough to actually hear his voice. So, Throughout this week, throughout this uh, 
four-week series, I'm going to give you four turbulence principles. Here's turbulence principle number one. Check your gauges. Check your gauges, okay? There are some gauges I want to give you today, some gauges that you need to check and you need to be keeping an eye on. If, if you are going to rise above the turbulence, maybe even avert the turbulence altogether. Mark chapter 6, verse 31, it says about Jesus, it says, Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not have a chance to eat. How many of you is that you right there? Come on, that's you, that's you, your day. You're just coming and going and running so hard. You just didn't even have a chance to eat. I just had to work through the breakfast. I just had to run. I had to work through the lunch. I just had to, and you're just coming. And listen to me, Jesus sees you. He sees your hurry. He sees your pace. He sees it. And look what he says. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Okay, he sees it. He's not, he's not looking at you going, man, what the heck is wrong with you? Don't you know? What you, haven't you figured this out yet? Why are you doing this? Why you, no, no, he sees it. He sees your pace. And what, is, what he says is, hey, come with me. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. I think that's one of the, the, the hallmarks of a disciple is, is this rest of our soul. That we have this posture that is, that is rest. So let me give you some gauges to help you, like, check your gauges. If some of you, like, you need this. This is your message today. Like, this is why you're, you're at church today th to hear this word, okay? Let me give them to you. Number one is refocus on what matters most. You got to refocus on what matters most. And I'm just going to go ahead and set aside some time, right? Not just, I, I don't need to do every activity that comes my way in this holiday season. I don't need to go to every event. I don't need to go to every dinner. I don't need to go to every party. I don't need to say yes to everything. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna refocus on what matters most. Because the truth is, you guys, you were made to run. You were made to run, man, and run fast. God made you uniquely, but you only have a limited amount of run in you. You only have a limited amount of energy and a limited amount of time. You cannot run in all directions. Because here's what, here's what some of our lives look like. Some of our lives look like this. You only have a limited amount of time and energy, so you're going in all these directions, but you're not making much, much impact. You're giving yourself your limited time and energy to a lot of things, therefore you're just not doing much. But if you were to refocus on what really matters, like your life could look like this. Like if you just look, refocus on what matters most, which by the way, that line is the sum total of all those other lines around it. You can go so much further and faster if you refocus on what matters most. So what matters most then? That's the question then. What, what, what does matter most? I think three things matter most than all the other things that get your time and get your energy and get your attention. Three things that matter most. Write these down. The first thing that matters most, most is relationships. Relationships matter most, but why is it it's the first thing to get cut when we're busy? It's the first thing that gets the back burner. Is, is my time with my kids or my time with my wife or my time with the relationships that matter. It's the group that I'm, that I'm in, the friends. I'm just going to knock off that because man, that's what actually matters most. Relationships matters most. No one on their deathbed is wishing that they would spend another day at the office. They're wishing they had more time with their family or with their wife, their husband, with the people that matter most. Most of the time for our relationships, they're... There are some activities that don't need to be done today, right? Like, like on Sunday, I would encourage you, like when, you, when Jesus is inviting you to this, this rest that he's inviting you to, I believe that you need a day of rest. Like you need a day. And I would encourage you, like if you can, make it today. Make it Sunday. Because some of you, you've done, you've done a really good thing, and I applaud you for coming to church. Like you're taking the time. You're taking the time to say, you know what? I'm going to give God some of, this, some of my time today. But can I encourage you to not just give him an hour and a half, but give him the whole day. Like make it, that's why they call it the Lord's day, not the Lord's hour and a half. What would, it, what would it look like? What would your life look like if you just prioritized relationships on the Lord's day? Or you didn't do so much, but you actually spent time with the people that matter most. You didn't go and just kind of continue. You just, well, I, I, you went out to eat and stuffed yourself and took a nap and, and then got up and spent some time with people, grabbed the hand of that woman you love and take a walk with her. And then pick her up off the ground because she fainted, you know what I mean? And 
Continue your stroll of your, of your walk. Relationships matter most, okay? That's why we always encourage you to get into a group. Get into a group, man. You need, why? Because relationships matter. That's why. We prioritize relationships. Here's what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4.12. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. So listen, if you're going through turbulence alone, you're going to have engine failure. You're going you're to be defeated. But two can stand back to back and conquer. Three is even better. Here's what he's saying. Here's, here's what he's saying. A group is even better. One, you're going to fail, you're going to fall, turbulence, engine failure, it's going to happen. Two is pretty good. Look, some of you, you have a friend. You got a friend, and that's what's keeping you from a group, because you got a friend. You're good. Don't settle for good when God has called you to live better. Okay, so because one, uh, you're going to fail. Two, good, you can stand back to back, but a group is even better. A group is even better. Some of you got, you're like, oh, I got a, I got a friend. You got a friend that lives in the other state, and that's, that's not a friend. You need to walk with somebody. You need, relationships matter. Second thing you need to evaluate when you're refocusing, like what matters? Relationships matter. Number two, purpose matters. Your purpose matters more than you actually think it does. Your life is going to be happiest and most fulfilling when you're doing what God has called you to do. I think there's an important concept. It's a misnomer by a bunch of people, but, but people think that burnout comes from doing too much activity. That's actually a misnomer. Burnout does not come from doing too much activity because there are some activities that you can do that actually add life back to you. So, so burnout does not come from doing too much activities. Listen to me. Burnout comes from doing activity with no purpose. Okay, are you hearing me, guys? Burnout comes from doing things that have no purpose. It's just, it's just not living with purpose. That's where burnout comes from. So if you find yourself doing a bunch of things that didn't matter constantly throughout your day, activity without purpose equals burnout. Purpose matters more than you know. Because here's what happens to so many people. Like for some of you, and this, this is a word for some of you. For some of you, it's not the pace of your life. It's the purpose of your life. For some of you, you have a turbulence on the inside of you. Oh, I'm speaking to somebody right now. You have a turbulence inside of your soul and in your mind, and you, you're doing the right things. You have the right pace. You have the right people. You have like, but, and you're wondering like, why am I still like unsettled and still unsetting? And I got this anxiety and I have this, and I have this stress and I have like, I'm, I feel like there's turbulence, but there's nothing, there's actually nothing really, I can't pinpoint it. It's not the pace. It's not living with purpose. You're not living God's purpose for your life. That's where your turbulence is coming. It matters more than you know. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. This is what Paul said. The apostle Paul said, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work that the Lord Jesus gave me to do. You have a work, an assignment that Jesus has given you to do. Here's what you need to do. Find it and work it. Like, find it and refocus your life from all the things that you're giving your time and your energy to that is limited. Refocus some of that to the purpose of your life. That's actually why we've created our Discovery Track classes. A lot of you have been through our Discovery Track. Some of you have not here at Discovery. We, actually, we started every first Sunday of the month. These tracks, these classes, there's three of them. They will help you discover your purpose. Not just connect you to the life of the church, but to help you discover why you're even living like your gifts and your personality because your design reveals your destiny okay so relationships matter your purpose matters and here's the last one number three is, is eternity matters eternity matters we're all living in this vapor this mist of called life on earth man we just it's so short it's so so what do we do we work toward it we give toward it we live toward it jesus says like store everything uh, the, like put everything there in eternity um, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. It says, Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world. And we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So all that stuff that you're running after, that you're working toward, you're giving your time and your energy to the accomplishments and the things and the more, it's not going with you. If it's not relationships, purpose, or eternity, 
it's not going with you. It doesn't matter. And yet we still let all those things rob our time. Robert, and it's creating turbulence. So I'm just giving you some gauges, some gauges you can check. Refocus on what matters. Here's the second thing that we need to do. Reduce the non-essentials. Reduce the non-essentials. Now, there's a bunch of non-essentials in our life, man. Like, like, and you can never really eliminate all the non-essentials in your life, but I think you can reduce them. Like you can, you can look at your, like just your week right now. You can sometimes today, you can look at your week and you can deduce for yourself, like maybe eight hours of Netflix is not the best idea. You know what I mean? You can figure that out for yourself. Like that's not the best use of my time. Cause there are some things, listen to me, that are robbing you of your time that are just not important. It's, it's non-essential. King Solomon had a great piece of advice in Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse six. He says, better one handful with tranquility. That's that peace of God that causes us to rise above the turbulence. Here's what Solomon said. If you want to rise above the turbulence, you got to be a one handful kind of person. Better is one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and a chasing and a running and a grinding, chasing after the wind. And some of you are like, but pastor, I got two hands. What am I going to do with the other one? Yeah, but he... You're not able to receive anything or do anything if you got both hands full. Okay? And so Americans today are spending 117% more than their income. Do you know that? This is, this is like, that's more than you have. It's too much. It's not just two handfuls. You're trying to get a foot in there. You're all, it's too much. Because we think if $1 is good, help me out, then $2 is, is better, right? That makes sense, right? If one Krispy Kreme is good, then two Krispy Kremes are there you go. If one wife is good, then two wives are wrong, wrong. Don't you do that. Don't go there now. It's a different message now. <laughs> you got to slow down the pace, man. Reduce the nine essentials. You know what I do? Like, take the, I don't, my day of rest is not Sunday. Can't, my, Sunday's not my day of rest. That's my day of work. I pour out a lot. Monday is my day of rest. So on my Monday, I'm not making to-do lists. I make not to-do lists. I look at my day and I look at my week and I'm like, what am I not going to do? I'm not going to do this. I'm, I'm not going to do that. I, that's, that's my time to, re to, to prioritize what matters most. I mean, some of us don't have that moment of rest and posture. We're just going, going, going and your pace is killing you. It was just this last day of rest that I had. I actually, I, I had a commitment that I was supposed to make. This week I was supposed to go coach a lot of pastors and travel with a few pastors and and do a lot of coaching, and I was going to be gone for most of the week, and, and I'm looking at my schedule on my Monday, and I'm, and I'm feeling it, you guys. I'm feeling it in my soul. I'm feeling out of balance. I'm feeling the hecticness in my soul. The lights were coming on for me. The, the previous week, I had gone on a retreat with my staff and my pastors, as a lot of you know, and I prepared for that. We're like, I'm planning for things that are like five and ten years out, and, and I'm creating new resources, and, and we're working and grinding to get to that retreat. And then right after that retreat, I'm going to go and out and coach a whole bunch of other pastors, and I'm sitting there on my day of rest, looking at my not-to-dos and to-dos, and, and I feel it in my soul. The lights are going off, and, and, and so I, I made a decision in that moment to, no, I can't do it. I'm not, I'm not going to go and do that travel thing. I'm going to have to say no to that because now I could have I could have gone and maybe I would have been okay or maybe God would have allowed me to come to the end of myself because listen anytime you're out of balance there's always consequences it'll always cost you something and I'm thankful I was actually preparing this message and I'm saying like listen to me, you guys this message is as much for me as it is for you guys okay I can get out of balance really quick I, I can run I can grind I can go but I, I have to have moments in my life where I posture where I rest where I say God breathe and and show me where to commit and where not to commit and slow myself down or else I can get easily out of balance here you may want to write this down if you learn to say no you'll trade popularity for respect some of, you, some of you keep saying yes to everything because you want to be liked. And instead of being liked, what you should want is respect. All right? So, so trade saying no for being liked, for your popularity, and you'll get that respect that you want. Okay? Okay, here's the third thing. So you got to refocus, reduce. And then number three, reprioritize your life. Reprioritize 
your life. Listen to me, this is a powerful principle right here. I don't know if you know how powerful this is. That, that listen, you, just, you can't just have good things in your life. You have to know what priority to have those good things in your life. For a lot of you in this room, like you have the right elements. You have people that are around you that are healthy, that are good. You have, you have access to groups and leaders and pastors and teams. And, and, and you, have, uh, you, you come to church, you're here. You got a church. You got a great church, by the way. Amen. You got a great church. You got a great worship team. You got great stuff like that. And, and so it's not that you, have, it's not that you don't have good things. Listen to me. It's that you're, you're doing them out of order. The order is important. The order in which you do things is important. It's not enough just to have good things uh, and not just know what to do, but listen to me, to know what to do first. It's, n- to, it's, not, it's not just about knowing what to do, but knowing what to do first is what's important. Your order is important. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to skip down to that verse. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. Jesus says, so why are you worrying? Why do you keep on worrying? You keep worrying about your life, saying, how am I going to do that? How am I going to do this appointment? How am I going to respond to these emails? How am I going to buy, buy this? How am I going to, you know, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? And he says, for the pagans do that. And they're running. They're running after all these things. That's the, the, the lifestyle of a non-God living. That's non-God living. Just running, running, running after these things. Running, running, running. Running, running, running. God is, Jesus says, look, man. You're running like people who don't know God. The pagans are running after all these things. And your heavenly father knows you have emails. Your heavenly father knows that you have needs. Your heavenly father knows you have homework. Your heavenly father knows you don't have enough. Your heavenly father knows that you need them. So here's the solution. But seek first. Seek first. The order is important. It's, it's not just about having God in your life, having good things in your life. It's putting them in the right order. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And instead of running around like people who do not know God, after all these things that you're spending your time and your energy on, seek me first and I'll be the one that provides it for you. And I'll give you those things. I added a, a verse last. This verse was a little late added. I don't know if it got in your notes. Matthew chapter 11. I feel like this, like this is, I want you to just receive this, this word, because I really believe like this is what God's invitation is today, to this word, to this intervention moment, to the lights that are going off, to the seatbelt signs and the turbulence that you're experiencing. Here's, here's, I believe, the invitation that the Lord put on my heart. Jesus said, come to me. Come to me. And you can, you can continue running. You can continue grinding. You can continue trying to, to, to do it all. It'll cost you. Here's the solution. Come to me. All of you who are weary and carry heavy burden. All of you who are experiencing some turbulence in your life and I will give you your soul is craving rest peace this this ability to rise above with rank power and authority all of the anxiety the pressures and the commitments the peace of god that transcends all understanding can i pray that over you with every head bow and every eye closed this this morning